and I got this question yesterday, and we're going to try to get through as much as possible. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what I do and how I think about markets and how I find things and so on and so forth. And I think that's going to answer a lot of these questions. And then toward the end, or once I get through talking about that, I want to pick apart or answer, I should say, each individual line to the best I can. And then again, we'll follow up over, over coming coming weeks. So before we do that, keep in mind that most of my trading comes from picking stocks. And 90% of that can be taught quickly. If you follow along in the Facebook group, you'll notice somebody will say, hey, I like this stock. And I'm like, you know, it's got a big gap against the trend in the setup. And it, uh, it, or it might have some overhead resistance, or it's kind of wide and loose, or the trend is decelerating, or the trend is mostly one or two or three bars. And 90% of that is is pretty easy, and you should be able to recognize it. And then obviously, if you're new to trading, you, you might not notice all these things. But as I point them out over and over and over again, and like yesterday, I put a crappy example out there to see what you guys thought, and y'all immediately do what I was doing. You know, I was kind of fishing for comments. And the point is that the stock picking is not that hard, but it does take some time. It does take some experience. So 90% can be taught really quickly. Again, uh, watch for overhead supply, gaps against the trend, laps against the trend, uh, deceleration, like I just said, ability for the stock to trade cleanly, persistency, acceleration of trend. And I know I'm kind of being redundant here, but all of these things are fairly easily taught. It's the getting used to seeing them and being able to see them and see clearly and see what is that takes a little bit of while. Like one of my clients often says, it's kind of caught, not taught. Now, I do pay attention to signals such as the TFM temper system and major bow ties, a major bow tie is something coming off of an all-time high in the market or at least a multi-year low for lows and things like that. And I'll flesh out what I do somewhat mechanically here in a little while. And by the way, I've become friendly with mechanical. People do things uh, on a somewhat of a mechanical basis and they um, they kind of see me as being more mechanical than I kind of let on. And I kind of see them as being a little bit more discretionary than they let on. So I think it's okay once you develop your methodology to, to be a little mechanical in a lot of things you do. And a lot of things, like I just said, those could actually be mechanical things. Not that you want to program them in, but you want to have a, a checklist. And I'm actually working on a checklist of these things to look for, such as, again, overhead supply, et cetera. Now, as I mentioned throughout tonight and forever, a lot of my research is empirical. And, you know, maybe if I do find something that's kind of interesting, then I'll go in and do some hardcore research on it. But most of the stuff I do is just by looking at charts and looking at charts over and over and over and over and over again. And I look at a couple thousand stocks every night and I look at a couple hundred IPOs every day. And then I watch the market way more than I should all day long. <laughs> and I'm looking at sectors and all the ETFs. And then lately I've been fascinated with these zero DTE options, which is it's kind of like a, a lot of trading. It's like right when you're about ready to get up, give up, you just knock it out of the park and that kind of sucks you back in. Anyway, well, I have a lot more to say about that in the future. Now, one thing, for instance, here's kind of like the empirical research and then I was working on an IPO course, I guess it's probably been, it's, I don't know how long it's been, maybe 10 years ago. And in some of that research, I noticed that many IPOs die out during the first week of trading. And I just sorted IPOs tonight by volume. And this happened to be the first one that come came up. And I'm like, ah, oh, perfect, exactly what I'm pointing out. Notice that this thing came public and just pretty much died out. And the other thing I noticed is that, well, many never take out the day one high okay so they'll make a high on day one and that high is never exceeded so it's like people all the time there say well dave when when should i buy this new hot ipo or it's supposed to be a hot ipo and i was like and i'm always like well wait till at least to close the day five and let's see how it shakes out before putting your hard-earned money 
or putting in capital in harm's way, I should say. So notice that it never did take out that day one high before it imploded. Now, that gave me a rule, wait at least five days or the close of the fifth day before buying any IPO. And then since the day one high often sets the high for the week, the IPO must close above that high before I'll consider it. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. This is the buy at B pattern. And I'm not gonna teach you the whole pattern tonight because I've, I've done it a million times before, but I just wanna kind of show you where that came from. So my other thinking is if an IPO is, is going to go to the moon, it's gonna to have to close at a new high first. So at least the close of day five, which you have here, and you can see this stock began to take off afterwards. So therefore, with a few caveats like price, volume, range, et cetera, consider buying IPOs at new closing highs on day five or later. So that's how I came up with the buy at B setup. Now, the beauty of the buy at B is it's a little bit more mechanical than a lot of stuff that I do. It's going to take a while for you to learn how to trade pullbacks properly. You're going to have to make sure the trend is solid enough, the pullback is deep enough, and all the other stock selection stuff that I kind of alluded to a second ago. But something like this with a little bit of work, and I know John's in here tonight, John Ross like took the ball and ran with it, or run with, I always get this, uh, those confused. But anyway, uh, and he's done quite well with the IPOs. He's our resident IPO expert now in the Facebook groups. And I think that's, that's awesome. And it's something that he picked up on quickly. Now, shifting gears a little bit, does this, you think this is a good system? Is this a good signal? It looks pretty good to me. Well, this came off of a tweet, and it's a joke, obviously. But I was sitting here a few days ago, and the squirrel hops up on my little bear that I have outside my office. He's got a little bow tie on. You can't see it from the side, but he's got a little bow tie on. And he, like, climbed up on the little railing we have here and shat, literally shot on his head. <laughs> And then he puts nuts in his face. And so I'm thinking like, all right, well, there's a sign that the bear market's over. And as you can see, going back a slide, it worked out pretty good, right? Well, obviously that's not conceptually correct. So it must be conceptually correct. Now, I never heard of that term until I was doing some research with Larry Connors many years ago. And I fat fingered something in my programming as you often do if you ever programmed a computer. And we've got some really good results out of something, and then we couldn't figure out why it was working. And I showed it to Larry and everything, and it just wasn't conceptually correct. It just so happened to work. So anything that's not conceptually correct, Larry said we have to toss out. Now, let me kind of explain conceptually correct to you. Take Landry light pullbacks, for instance. Landry light is lows greater than pull than the uh, moving average, right? And we're looking for 10 days and ideally maybe 20 or more days to show that the market's trending. Now there's some caveats there too. We want some acceleration. We want some solid, make sure it's a solid trend. And then we're looking for a pullback to the moving average. And we look to buy if and only if it triggers an entry. So my thinking behind this pattern and pullbacks in general is strong trends equal demand for a market and the correction knocks out the weak hands and the trend knockout is a pattern i often like to talk about when it comes to psychology of the psychology of technical analysis and if you think about it technical analysis is based on the psychology of the market players we're looking to read the mindset of the market by looking at the charts okay and in something like a trend knockout, you got a really strong trend and you get this knockout bar. Well, you know that some shorts got attracted in. You know that some longer term trend traders probably got knocked out. You know that the Johnny come lately, so are very, very fickle and have very little money, very little staying power, very little patience or very emotional. They tend to be the last ones in and the first ones out. It can often wreak havoc on your positions. And that creates that knockout bar. 
and I've actually been long stocks and get knocked out on a knockout bar and I'll dust myself off, pick myself up, dust myself off, you know, like the Peter Tosh song. And I look at the chart and say, you know, this chart looks pretty good. And the next day, go right back in that same stock on a re-trigger, of course. So there has to be some sort of concept behind what you're doing that's conceptually correct. So for instance, I, I know the little squirrel example is kind of stupid at uh, eighth grade sophomore or whatever. But like in one of the market wizards or, or one of the books that I read here, it um, it said that that somebody noticed that when, when the cows were on one side of the field, soybean prices went up. And it happened to be a fairly robust type of system, but obviously they wouldn't trade off of it or didn't trade off of it because conceptually they couldn't prove that there was a concept to to trade off of. It didn't make sense. It was not conceptually correct, in other words. You're welcome, John. Now, when a pullback triggers, it suggests that, that doesn't guarantee, obviously, that the longer term trend is resuming. And that's why we want to pick the best and leave the rest and make sure we're getting into strongest stocks that are accelerating and all those other good things I just talked about, all those trend qualifiers to make sure it's looking really, really good. Pick the best and leave the rest. Now, it's got to be simple and you got to be careful because complexity is going to equal curve fitting. The more you noodle, if you're doing a mechanical system, for instance, the more you noodle with and the more parameters you add in, it's going to become more and more complex and you're going to end up curve fitting. And I guarantee you that system's going to blow up pretty quickly. So I would work to to come up with something really, really, really simple. And I'm going to kind of pick apart a little bit the TFM 10% system in just one second. But I can guarantee you, if you come up with a complex system, you have curve fit to the prior data, and that's not going to act that way in the future. 